How you doing tonight? Boy, it's been wet, hasn't it? Just wet and nasty. Thank you for coming out on such a nasty night, and I hope that you'll come even if it does rain 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> this will be the safest place to be. We'll just call this place the Ark, okay? So you come here, and we'll be studying how, it, how we really get in the Ark of Safety with God. So glad you're here tonight. And let me ask you, is there anybody new here tonight who wasn't here last night? Can I see your hands? All right. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Glad you're here. Uh, we had a wonderful time last night. Just want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing for the new folks. This, and I don't know that I even mentioned this last night to you, but you're part of something bigger than even what's happening here. We have 32 of these seminars taking place across the uh, Maryland and Delaware area happening at the same time as this, doing Revelation Speaks Peace. We have another about 50 of them taking place over in Iowa, Missouri at this same time. So there are hundreds and hundreds of people studying the prophecies right now. And I personally think it's a very good time to be studying prophecy, don't you? When you look at what's happening in our world, it's just amazing. And you want to know, you want to dig in and find out what does the Bible have to say about prophecy? What's going on right now? Now, as I mentioned last night, what we're doing here is we're going to what the Bible says. You know, you, you can go to seminars where somebody's going to read one text and then tell you what they think it means. That's not what I want to do. What I hope to accomplish here in our series is to give you the keys to figure out prophecy on your own. So we'll be covering the great themes of prophecy going through them one by one and laying it out and then turning you back to Scripture. And as we go through this, I'll be sharing with you the principles for understanding prophecy. In uh, Bill's quiz he just did, we talked about one of them, Daniel unlocks revelation. A lot of people do what I did many years ago when I first started prophecy, studying prophecy. I went straight to revelation and I just couldn't get it. And then somebody said, try Daniel first. And when you try Daniel first, it starts unlocking, and that's why we started last night with Daniel. So these are just some of the principles that, that we'll be sharing with you. Let me just give you a quick overview of some of the grand themes we will cover. Tonight we're looking at a planet in upheaval. What's going on in our world right now? Why is it in so much upheaval did the Bible predict these days? And then tomorrow night we'll look at Armageddon. You know, you look at what's happening in the Middle East right now, and just the, the conflict and the stress in Russia and Syria. And it's just amazing what's going on. We'll look at what the Bible has to say about Armageddon. We'll take Monday night off. We'll come back Tuesday night. By the way, tomorrow night's going to be dry. It's going to be very dry. It's going to be hugely dry. Or does he say hugely dry? <laughs> Trust me. I think you've heard that too, haven't you? It's going to be very dry tomorrow night, right? Amen? We're going to pray for dry weather, and I believe it's going to be dry. Tuesday night, Man of Revelation. Uh, this is chapter 4 of Revelation. This really is the pivot point in the book of Revelation. If you don't get this, you don't get what Revelation's about. And then the four horsemen of the apocalypse on Wednesday. We take Thursday night off, so it's Monday and Thursday night off because you, you do need to do some things at home. But we're on this intensive. We come back Friday night, the time of the end, part two, part one. And we're looking at one of the longest time prophecies in the Bible that reached closest to our day. Very relevant prophecy. It's so long, we do it in two parts. So Saturday night we come back for part two of this. It's very relevant. A lot of the Bible hangs on this prophecy. Okay, so these are some of the grand themes that we're covering. Now, Bill mentioned registration. As you come in, we ask you to register. Pretty standard fare for seminars. But the reason we do it, is so that we can provide materials to you to enhance your study. Now, I'll make you this promise. We will not sell your name to anybody, and we will not spam you. You know, I never liked spam growing up. That's the nasty, nasty meat pot fry byproducts, really. If you like it, forgive me, but it's just pretty foul to me. And so we'll not spam you. I never liked it growing up. I don't like it in my computer either. We'll just... Uh, get your information so that we can keep your attendance to give you these materials. Last night, I hope you got the DVD on Bible prophecy. It's a really great DVD. Hope you got that. If this is your first night, I believe we have some out there. Uh, feel free to ask them at the registration table so you can get a copy of this DVD as well. Each night, we'll have the study uh, guides that you'll get, the sermon notes. I encourage you to take notes, but if you just want to sit back and listen, 
you'll have all the Bible texts right there on the sermon notes as well. And then, as you get your uh, attendance scanned in each night, on your third time here, you'll get free gifts. And the first one we'll give you will be the Bible promise book, Thousand Bible Promises. You know, the Bible says that we live by His promises, and these are exceedingly great and precious promises. They have power to actually give you victory over the devil and in situations in your life. So we want you to have that book. Another uh, thing to keep in mind is as we go through this stuff, you may have questions. I may say something, you go, well, how does that relate to the rapture? How does that relate to the tribulation? Or where's the mark of the beast fit into this? And this is why we take so many nights, because you really can't answer it all in one night. If you came here, we'd have to have a marathon session to really cover it all. So we split it up, give you time to digest it, but then as you have questions, I want to encourage you to write them down. You can write them down, and uh, we have a question box out there. I think it's a, a little black box. Nothing significant about being a little black box, but you just put your question in there, and we will answer those in a few nights. We'll open up the question box, and we'll spend a little of our introductory time here answering those questions. Now, last night... I gave you a response card. Each night I'll give you a little response card so I can get feedback from you since we don't take questions and comments from the floor so we can keep our flow going here. But I asked you this question, what do you hope to get from this seminar? Let me share with you some of the things that you said. I really enjoyed reading these. A uh, number of you said, I want a better understanding of Revelation and prophecy. Book of Revelation is a puzzle. I need an explanation. Well, that's what we are here for, to help you unlock it. A deeper understanding of the Bible, a desire to know what the symbols mean, like the mark of the beast, the tribulation, and the rapture. We will cover all of that right here. Others said, I want to understand God's plan for his children in this time. In other words, how does all this relate to us as Christians, if you're a Christian? This person said, most importantly, I want a better understanding of God. I want to experience God. And someone said, I want to have understanding, knowledge, peace, and hope. It's revelation you know, of peace. Uh, because that's, it, it does help you, not just your head, but your heart as well. It does bring peace and hope. And then I, I really appreciate this person said, I hope to understand the Bible and become a Christian. So it's, it's a great place to come to study the Bible because prophecy really validates that there is a God up there that loves us and cares for us. Because anybody that can predict something that's going to happen with precision thousands of years before it happens, and it actually comes true, that means this book is divine and there is a divine mind and person behind it and that person is God and Jesus Christ. So I believe you'll find your needs met here as well. And then um, this one, how to have a better relationship with God. Did I do that one? I just... All right, this is the next one. Uh, not sure, just listening. Why'd you come? I'm not sure, I'm just listening. I'm not sure what I'm gonna get out of this. And I like these, these are very honest. I came with no expectation, only an open mind, and I have no idea as of yet why I'm here. Maybe they came because their wife drug them here. I don't know. But uh, this, this seminar, as you come here, I believe you're coming because you're, you're seeking. You're looking for something. And I know that God will bless you as you come with that open mind, that open heart, as we all come together. We all learn together. Last night, as I was visiting with people on the way out, I was learning things, you know, people were sharing with me some things, so I always enjoy these times together, because I get to meet you, make new friends, but I learn, it helps me, as I, as I study for these, I actually learn, and then as I present it, I learn, and then as I talk to you, I learn, so it's a really rich environment to have people from so many different backgrounds, you know, different religions, different, all sorts of backgrounds, different denominations, it's a really rich and fun time to study together. Well, tonight our topic is a planet in upheaval. Bill prayed earlier, but join me now as I pray for God's blessing on our time together. Father in heaven, thank you that we can come here. And Lord, I just want to pray that your spirit will be in our midst here because this is a divine book that we're studying and we need your guidance. We want to understand what you have to say for, to us through these prophecies. And, and we all come from different walks of life today and you can tailor these uh, prophecies to each of us for the work that you're doing in our lives right now. And I pray that you'll do that because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our topic tonight is a planet in upheaval. Last night, 
we start it by talking about a world is in crisis. And as you look around our world tonight, indeed it is in crisis. There's, there's trouble on every side, politically, socially, financially. We have tension between the nations. In fact, that tension is so strong today across the world in every area, people wonder if we are not at a breaking point. You know, the spot of no return where things are just stretched so tight that when it snaps, it has devastating consequences. And as you look at our world tonight and see how unsettled it is, you might ask this question, as millions of people do, was this predicted? Did, does the Bible anticipate this? Did God see this coming? Or is, are we caught by surprise? Well, as you look at the Bible, I believe the Bible actually does anticipate our day. In fact, the Bible gives us signs of what we call the last days. And it tells us that indeed the end is straight ahead. You know, in fact, the disciples met with Jesus there near the end of his life in Matthew 24. And they asked Jesus a question that we could ask even tonight. And it's this question. In fact, let's ask Jesus this together by reading this off the screen, if I can hear you out loud. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Other translations say, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? You see, Jesus had predicted his return to this earth to his disciples. And they wanted to know how to be ready and what would be the signs that indicated that he was coming soon. And so Jesus gives them the answer there in Matthew 24 and he lays out some amazing predictions about what would happen near the end and let's read it it starts here with Jesus saying he answered and said to them take heed that no one what deceives you now that word deception is key and as you look at that you'll see that it comes up as a theme because Satan is in the business of deception isn't he and does Satan want God's people to be ready in the last days when Jesus comes does Satan want people to give their heart to Jesus to be ready? No way. And so he does everything he can in the last days to lay out so many deceptions and so many distractions to keep people away from Christ. Jesus goes on and he says, For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So Jesus says, listen, you want signs, let me tell you the signs. There's going to be a lot of deception. There will be those that claim to be Christ. There will be famines and earthquakes and pestilences. All this stuff is going to happen as a sign before I come. Now, I, I've done this a lot. I've taught these seminars literally around the world. And I've met the skeptic. And the skeptic says this, that's nonsense. We've always had wars. We've always had famines and earthquakes. There have always been people who have claimed to be the Messiah. And in a sense, they are correct, except for the next verse. You see, the context is very important. And in the next verse, Jesus says this, all these are the beginning of what? All these are the beginning of sorrows, you see. And so as you dig into the verse, you realize that this word sorrows means contractions in the Greek language in which this text was originally written. And the contractions relate to labor pains. How many of you women have experienced labor pains? How many of you guys have experienced labor? No. How many of you guys have watched a woman experience labor pains? Let me see your hands. It's hard work, guys, isn't it? It's really hard work. No, wait, la labor pains. Listen, when, when a woman gets pregnant, that, that baby grows in her womb, and then after nine months, what happens? Does the baby just kind of like pop goes the weasel? It's out? Well, I mean, pop goes the baby. I mean, some kids look like weasels. I'll give you that. But out comes the baby. Of course, my kids never look like weasels, but I've seen kids that look like weasels. You know, but they, pop goes the baby, out comes the baby, and, the, and everybody says, oh, the baby's here. D does it normally happen that way? Not at all, does it? What happens? They have this thing called, you have this thing called labor, right? The contractions start, and when they first start, they're, they're not as intense, and they're further apart. But the closer you get to the delivery time, what happens? Contractions are more intense, closer together, right? I remember when my wife had our first child. 
How long were you in labor? Come on. 12 hours. That's what I was guessing as well. She had to do the math. My wife is actually in the business of bringing people into the world. She actually delivers babies. So it's kind of a neat thing. You know, I prepare people to leave the world. She brings them into the world. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a tag team approach we have going on here. So anyway, 12 hours in labor. It started around noon, and my first daughter was born just a little bit after midnight. And, you know, when it began, I was there with her, you know, I watched this, but she's, she's doing the labor. She's doing all the whole hard work, you know. She's huffing and puffing, getting ready to blow the house down. I mean, she's sweating, she's pushing, and it was a hard labor. And finally, they had to use, what did they use? Those, those tongs, those salad tongs, right? Forceps, forceps. Jerk that puppy out, just pulled, pulled the kid out right there. So, you know, that was hard work. That's why they call it labor. And guys, you know, we, we kind of are like union workers, right? We're like union foremen. We just stand by and watch somebody else do all the work, right? So, so the baby is born. Jesus said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Yes, we've had earthquakes. We've had all these pestilences, and we've had false Christ down through time. But it was the beginning of the contractions in Jesus' day. But as we get closer to the end, those labor pains are going to come closer and closer and closer together and become more and more intense. So the question I want us to ask tonight is, how big are the contractions right now? Because if you look at the signs Jesus has laid out, yes, you can find them scattered throughout history. But as you look at our day, how big are these contractions right now? Are they intense? Are they close together? Now, as we look at this tonight, let me say one thing, is what we are not going to do is set a date for Jesus' return. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, that no man knows what? The day or the hour. You, you can't set the date. Some people say, well, you can know the year. And there have been people who've done that. They fail every time. Acts 1, 7 says you can't know the times or the seasons either. See, you can't know the day. You can't know the uh, hour. You can't even know the year. But you do have signs, and Jesus says the signs are there so you can know when it's near. And you might, you might even ask yourself, well, why doesn't he just give us the date? Why doesn't he just give us the date? And I imagine we could come up with a number of different reasons, but one obvious one that comes to my mind is humans are procrastinators. You know, we put it off. You know, you wait till the last minute. And here's the thing, is if he gave us the date... Your, that date might not be your last minute. You follow what I'm saying? You might not get to that date because you might breathe your last breath before that date and then you're lost. We need to be ready for Jesus all the time, amen? We need to live lives. And, here, and here's really is the crux of the matter is this thing about following God and, and going to heaven isn't about rules and regulations. It's about relationships. And, and you can't put off relationship. And you shouldn't put off relationship. Relationships are built day by day, experience by experience. And so God doesn't give us a day or the hour. He's saying, listen, I want you to walk with me day by day, and one day you'll walk with me right into the kingdom of God. And so that's what God wants us to do. So how big are the contractions? Let's explore that tonight. Jesus gave us three types of signs to watch for. He talks about religious signs political signs, and he talks about natural signs or signs in nature. Let's dig into the first one here, religious signs. Matthew 24, verse 5, Jesus said, Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive, how many? Many. Will deceive many. And then again, in verse uh, 23, he says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise, I believe that's in verse 24, actually, False prophets, false Christs will rise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even who? Even the elect. So there are going to be these false Christs, false uh, messiahs, and then it's going to get so bad that they're going to have great signs and wonders and miracles, and if it were possible, would deceive even the very elect. Now, let's go back and let's just roll the clock back just a few decades and let's see how this has been increasing over time. Let's go back to the 50s. You know this guy, Sun Myung Moon. He was a Korean preacher, and he started the Unification Church and, and the Moonies, right? 
And, and you might remember the Moonies were the ones that had the mass weddings or the mass blessing ceremonies. He was even actually pairing people up and making arranged marriages. And they'd walk in and have their wedding and get married, and then they were stuck with each other from there on out, even though they didn't know each other. Not really the way to go, in my opinion. But, you know, you might look at that and say, oh, well, it's just mass weddings, kind of crazy, not my thing, but it's pretty harmless uh, for most people. But really, when you dig into what this guy taught, he claimed to be the second coming of Christ, or the third Adam. Uh, and he said this, that he is living in me, God is living in me, and I am the incarnation of himself. He thought that he was God. Now, if, if you know the history of this thing, it all fell apart, it eventually fell apart, it's still going, but it's really reduced a lot since he died. His uh, family was a mess and just had a lot of problems going on. So then we come up into the 60s, 1969, we got Crazy Charlie. Charlie Manson, he inspires his followers to kill actress Sharon Tate there in 1969. And what a lot of people don't realize is that he was actually trying to trigger Armageddon. Tomorrow night we'll talk about Armageddon. But it, you remember the term helter-skelter? You know, he got that out of the Beatles album. He, he, he believed that the Beatles were speaking telepathically to him through the White Album that had just come out. And there was a song on there that had helter-skelter uh, term on it. And so he was trying to trigger Armageddon. And he, it, what's, what's phenomenal is this guy still has somewhat of a following. You saw in the news not too long ago this lady who wanted to marry him. Wow. Jim Jones the, the, of the People's Temple in the 70s, he viewed himself as the Messiah. He moved from San Francisco down to Guyana. 900 people committed mass suicide. Crazy, isn't it? And then you have David Koresh in Waco, Waco, Texas. You know, here he was in the 1990s. He also believed he was Christ. He had an interesting teaching. He believed that the first Christ, Jesus Christ, was sinless, but he was now the sinful Christ, to, to live sinfully uh, so that people could be saved. I, I don't know how that works because the Bible says Jesus is the sinless Christ, and that's how we're saved. I'd rather be saved by somebody sinless, don't you, than somebody that's sinful. And unfortunately, dozens of people... Some of them very intelligent people with, with advanced degrees, they all burned up together there in that compound and died together. Then you have Marshall Applewhite, 1997. The, um, a, a comet, what was the name of that comet? Uh, the hale -Bob comet was coming by. He taught that there was a flying saucer behind it, and they were going to get on that flying saucer and go live at the next level above humans. And so uh, 39 people committed mass suicide to go on a saucer trip, another crazy, crazy thing. You know, when you look at these, I don't know if you're like me, I just go, how does anybody fall for that stuff? Are you like that? It's just like, what, what's loose up there that you even fall for that stuff? But when you, when you study into the people that fall for it, they started off as normal people. And it's kind of scary. You know, they certainly didn't end as normal people. But here's what really concerns me. These, these are people that deceived, you know, lots of people, and, and there are a lot of people since this. There's a guy that was down in Miami and, and in the islands, a Hispanic guy. There's a Brazilian guy. There's another Korean guy. And these guys are still operating, deceiving people. So there are hundreds, if not thousands of people, in fact, it is thousands, being deceived right now by people who claim to be Christ. But here's the biggie. What we read earlier is the deception that's coming, Jesus said, is going to be so great so overmasteringly deceptive that even the elect would be deceived if it were possible. Revelation chapter 16 verse 14 says how that's going to happen, that these are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. So we're not talking about just some wacko that talks about a flying saucer. I don't want to go on a flying saucer trip anyway. I want to go with Jesus back to heaven, don't you? There's no flying saucer needed there. You know, we'll be able to fly through the air. But what Jesus is talking about here is something so deceptive that there are actually going to be these demons, and they're not going to come saying, I'm a demon. That's not what Jesus was talking about in the parallel verse over in Matthew 24. He's talking about so deceptive, it would deceive even the very elect, if possible. So when the devil deceives, he comes with subterfuge. He comes in camouflage, right? He claims to be of God, and he does these things in the name of God. 
but they're actually the spirits of demons working miracles. And so here's, here's something that you can just write down and just bank on it. Don't judge something of whether it's from God or not just because it's a miracle. Because the devil can do miracles. Do you believe that? The devil can do miracles. He's a supernatural being. He can do miracles. And so even if somebody looks like a Christian and they talk good about Christ, but then they do miracles, don't say, oh, that's got to be of God. Because it may not be of God at all. You know how you test whether they're of God or not? You test them up against this. This is God's revealed will in his holy word. And if they don't line up with this word, the Bible says it's because there is no light in them. And you run the other direction. So this is what's coming on the horizon. Great signs and lying wonders. And it's going to be the devil behind it. And we can know where we stand because we're studying the Bible. We know this is coming. Listen, you're part of a unique group of people. There aren't a whole lot of people. I mean, there, there are thousands of people studying Revelation, but there aren't millions and billions of people studying Revelation. So you're, you're doing your homework right now. You're prepping. You're going to know this. Most people are just going to fall for this as soon as they see a miracle. Listen, when this stuff starts happening, this will blow your mind. When this stuff starts happening, the devil starts doing all these miracles, there will be no more atheists in the world. You follow that? No more atheists. Why? What does an atheist ask for of religion? Give me what? Proof. Give me proof. I don't believe God exists. I believe this is all there is. You live this life. You die. You turn to dust. And that is it. So survival of the fittest. That's what an atheist believes. But they'll challenge a believer and say, prove to me that God exists. Listen, when the devil starts doing miracles in the name of God under this guise of a, of a Christ, but they're a false Christ, they're going to have all the proof they need to believe that there are supernatural powers out there. And they will fall for it hook, line, and sinker. And that's why we need to know the truth so that we can not only help ourselves, but help others as well. Now, not only is there a problem with these false Christs, but there's a problem within Christianity today, too, that's predicted in Bible prophecy. Paul talks about this in his second letter to Timothy. He says, In the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. Notice this next part. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What's he talking about there? He's talking about claiming to be Christian and yet not knowing the Christ of the religion. Not having the power of Christ in your life. George Barna, who does a lot of research, especially among Christian groups, is He's like a poll taker, but more of a researcher. Uh, a couple years ago, he asked North American Christians whether they agreed or disagreed with the basic beliefs of Christianity, key teachings of Jesus Christ, teachings that no one would have disagreed with just a generation or even half a generation ago. Let me show you what he discovered. It was taken in 2009. He asked, God is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe who rules the world today. Now, how many of you would agree with that? I agree with that. God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and he's in charge of the universe, he sets up kings, he takes down kings, and he's going to win in this battle with evil ultimately. But notice only 78% of Christians agreed with that. These are self-confessed, declared Christians. That should be 100%, shouldn't it? That should be 100%. It gets worse. The next one is, Satan is not a living being, but is only a symbol of evil. 59% agreed with that statement. Only 41% understand the truth of what the Bible says, that Satan is a real being, that he's a fallen angel, and he is at war with God and everything God stands for. Amen? So the next thing uh, he asked, Jesus sinned while living on earth. 39% agreed with this. That, now, I, I don't mean to be offensive, but if you miss that one, you're just kind of missing the whole thing about what Christianity is about. Because you see, we're born as sinners. It's in our DNA. You don't have to teach any of us how to do wrong. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We all deserve to die for our sin. The only way we're going to be saved out of this mess is somebody who's sinless 
pays the penalty for us. If Jesus was a sinner, then he would have had to die for his own sin, and he would have nothing of which to give us to save us from ours. But the Bible says Jesus lived a sinless life, not tainted at all by sin, and when he died on the cross, he didn't deserve to die, but he died for you and for me. And then out of the reservoir of his love, he's able to give us the salvation and the, uh, the forgiveness of our sins so that we can live eternally with him. That's good news, isn't it? And unfortunately, 39% of the Christians polled don't understand that. And without that, you can't even have the hope of salvation. This next one says, the Holy Spirit is a symbol of God's power or presence but is not a living entity. 58% agreed with that. In other words, they don't understand the nature of the triune God that's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they miss that whole thing. And they think the Holy Spirit is simply just a symbol of God's power or presence, but is not a living entity. Folks, the world has changed. A generation ago, you asked Christians this, they would have gotten this. This is, this is really basic Christianity 101. They would have gotten this. But the world is becoming what they call sociologists call postmodern, but it's really post-Christian, even within the church. Now, if this is not a fulfillment of what Paul predicted when he wrote that to Timothy, then I don't know what is. You know, that they have a form of godliness but deny the power. Let's move on. Let's look at political signs that are taking place today. You know, Jesus talked about what would happen. He says, You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars so that you're not troubled. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, we've always had war, right? Jesus isn't just talking about there's going to be war. What he's talking about is a dramatic increase in war and the intensity of war. Because remember, those contractions get more frequent, more intense as we go along in time. You know, when you look at what happened just in the last century, in the 20th century, 203 million people died as a result of warfare in the 20th century. Some people estimate that is more uh, in that century than all wars before that century combined. So we're talking about an amazing number of people who have died. In the last century, we became really good at war. You, when you look at, look at what has happened, for, for thousands of years, war consisted basically of lining up the opposing forces, and then they would charge at each other with their lances and their, you know, their, their handheld implements of war. And that's how they fought for thousands of years. But then you come to the 19th century, the 1800s, and then by that time they were lining up in plain sight of each other, right? And they were shooting each other. They, they had to see the faces and the eyes of the people that they were killing. But then you come to the 20th century, and you've got trench warfare, you have airplanes dropping bombs on people, and then you have the most devastating implement of war ever created, the atomic bomb. But now we're in the 21st century, and what we have in the 21st century is really detached. It's, it's efficient, it's deadly. Like what you see in this training video, this tank is uh, pulling a vehicle that has nobody in it, and a drone takes it out. You know, you can have somebody sitting in another part of the world flying this drone, this manless drone that's carrying weapons of war, and boom, just annihilate somebody or something. Very detached, very remote. That's where we are now in the 21st century. Back in the 1800s, there was this godless philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche, and Nietzsche declared that God was dead. He said, God is dead, God remains dead. In fact, he says, we have killed God, because he thought God was just a figment of people's imagination. People were becoming more intelligent now, and now they don't believe in God. We have killed God. But what's interesting about Nietzsche, not just that he declared that God is dead, because others have done that, but Nietzsche saw the implications of declaring God is dead. He said, if people accept this idea in the next century, the 20th century, he said, it's going to be marked as one of the bloodiest centuries of all time. Because when you take God out of the equation, there's no final judgment. There's no answering for your life. There are no moral absolutes. People just start, it's, it, it truly is survival of the fittest. If I can build a bigger weapon, a bitter, bigger bomb, I can be more intimidating, I can get more then why not do it? And Nietzsche called it right when he said, if people will accept this idea that God is dead, this is where it is going. And so, friends, we've had tremendous amount of wars. In fact, right now, 
there are more than 50 armed conflicts taking place around the world. In fact, you can go to Wikipedia and there's a page that just keeps a track of what's going on right now. Right now, across our world, 50 armed conflicts going on. In fact, every one of the UN's 192 member nations is party to a territorial trade or other international dispute. All 192 of those nations are arguing nation against nation, fighting and arguing over some. Some of these are just kind of like court case arguments. Others are really intense. I mean, you look at what's going on right now. Have you seen in the news this week what's happening with Japan and China? You know, Japan is saying, wait a minute, this is our territory. You come here, we're going to shoot you out of the sky. And China says, try it. You know, we've got 1.2, 1.3 billion people they'll overwhelm Japan. And China is out there just gobbling up territory uh, from other nations. In the Philippines, in the, in the South, uh, what is it, the South Philippine Sea or the South China Sea. It, it's crazy what's going on right now. And yet we see it as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, nation against nation. There are eight countries that we know of that have nuclear weapons. And they have enough warheads to kill off the human race 50 times over in less than an hour. That's crazy, isn't it? You know, what's it, uh, we, we just hope nobody, you know, starts this whole thing. You know, now we have Iran, and, and their intention is to, to build a bomb. And they've, they've said, they, they deny that because of the nuclear treaty, but you look at how they talk now that the nuclear treaty is signed, you know? And they'd love to see nothing more than to see Israel wiped off the map. In fact, that kind of fits into, we'll talk about this tomorrow night when we talk about Armageddon, but the Muslims have this view of this apocalypse happening in the last days. They don't call it Armageddon. That's a Christian term. But they have a similar view of that. And, and the fanatics would love nothing more than to spark a nuclear war of this type to bring along Armageddon. And then you look at Russia in the Middle East and other places. They're pushing back into countries that they lost when the wall came down in 1989. You look at the Crimea in, in the Ukraine. And then you have North Korea. We talked about this last night. They've tested nuclear bombs twice this year. Let me ask you, what would it take to start World War III, you think, in, in this day and age? Eight countries with nuclear weapons. Pakistan and India are really tense with each other right now. That was, again, in the news. Uh, they, they threatened. Uh, Pakistan said, you mess with us, we may have to use our bomb. That's, that was in the news this week. You know, what would it take to start World War III? Not a whole lot, actually. We, you know, it's by God's grace that we're not in World War III. And we need to keep praying for God's grace. But then you look at, in the political world, what may come financially. You know, we talked last night about the increasing debt, the, the balloon that's happening with national debt in our country. But look what the Bible says is going to happen in the financial world. In James 5, verses 1 through 3, we read this. Come now, you rich... Weep and howl for your miseries, they're coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you like fire. You have heaped up treasure in, what's it say? The last days. What days? The last days. He's talking about people just heaping up their treasures, this great accumulation of wealth. We've never had more millionaires and billionaires in the history of the world than we have today. People with insane amounts of wealth. And God says you can heap all that up you want, but you're going to lose it if you don't use it for my glory. You know, we look at what happened in 2000 to 2009, the, the Great Recession, and we look at the Great Depression, and these things are going to look like a walk in the park with what's coming on this planet. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, when he looked at his kingdom, we studied this last night, he didn't think his kingdom would ever end, that it would ever fall, and yet God said another kingdom would overthrow it, and it happened just like that. In fact, if you look at any of those kingdoms we studied last night, whether it's Persia, Greece, or Rome, Rome ruled for over 600 years, none of them thought they would come tumbling down. But let me tell you, there is an expiration date on every kingdom. The Bible says God's kingdom is coming someday. And when he comes, the earth is going to be in a mess, as we saw last night. In the feet of that image, it was of iron and clay, and it doesn't stick together. It falls apart. Have you ever baked something, ladies, and, you know, a cake or something, and it just doesn't bind together, and it all falls apart? 
My wife made something the other day. She's a really good cook. I'm the one that messed it up. She wasn't home, and she had something in the oven, and it was... It, was, uh, it smelled really good, and I heard the alarm go off, and I thought, I'm going to be the helpful guy. Big mistake. I pulled the thing out. It was, it was a meatloaf in a pan, and I thought, well, I've got to get this thing out of the pan because it's going to sweat and all this. And when I turn it up, it just falls like in a big mess. It just all falls apart. And I learned later, no, it needed to cool in the pan first. So I tried to cover my sins up. I scooped it all back up and shoved it down the pan and stuck it in the oven and pretended like nothing happened. She looked at it. What happened here? I don't know. No, I, I, I told her the mess I made. But, you know, this world is like that. It's just not nothing's holding together now. And that's why Jesus has to come back. And so in, part of that falling apart will be financial crises. It's talked about in Revelation. Revelation chapter 13 t- talks about a time when we're not going to be able to buy or sell, all our buying and selling is going to be controlled by the government. And, and listen, we're headed that way right now. They're, they are talking at the highest levels about cashless society. And how many of you don't actually use cash much? Can I see your hands? Don't use cash much. I don't. I, I can go for weeks without a single dollar in my, in my uh, billfold and never miss it because I use I use the card all the time. We're moving that way. In fact, there's a country in Europe that is seriously considering going cashless. I believe it's in the Netherlands. And they're talking about going totally cashless. And it, cashlessness society actually solves a lot of problems. It, w- it, it takes care of taxation because every transaction, transaction is, is tracked. It takes care of illegal activities because all those transactions are are cashless as well. So you talk about you shutting down the drug trade or make it much more difficult, you know. Hey, I want to buy my kilo of marijuana, you know. Well, let me take your credit card and we're going to swipe it on the iPhone or whatever, you know, sign here. Yeah, they're not going to do that. So cashless society makes a whole lot of sense. And the more we have crime and problems in our world, more and more restrictions actually make sense. You follow what I'm saying? I think that's what this whole terrorism thing is about. It is a setup. It is, it is boxing us in a corner. Because what you have is you have people with a fanatical religious ideology who are out to kill you. And, and, and you get to the place where when you go to the mall, like I've been to the malls in certain countries, where they stand and you go through a metal checker. In, in Lebanon, there's a guy at the door, there's a metal checker, there's a soldier at the door. There are soldiers in, on all the corners sitting in pillboxes with, with uh, sandbags there, and they're sitting there with machine guns and heavy artillery on the street corners. And when your country becomes an armed camp, you start saying, I wish for the olden days. I wish for the old days when we can walk down the street, go to the store, and not be afraid that we're going to get blown up or killed. And you know what would settle this problem? Keep those people out of this country. Let's protect our country. It just makes sense. It makes sense. And eventually, that's probably where that's going to go. But what happens is we're willing now to give up rights. You follow what I'm saying? We start, hey, I don't care if the NSA tracks all my phone calls. I'm not doing anything bad. Tracks all my transactions. But one day, the Bible says, all that technology will be used against us to control buying and selling. And in the midst of all that, maybe the catalyst is what we're reading right here in James, where the whole financial markets fall apart. In fact, right now, China is, is having some real problems financially. The China debt bomb is getting ready to explode. you got Deutsche Bank in, uh, in Germany. That's becoming a big mess. They'll probably bail them, bail, you know, just print more money. I wish I could do that for my finances, but that would get me in a bunch of trouble. Print more money, solve the problem. But that only makes it worse because it just makes the balloon get bigger and bigger. And when it pops, it's going to get really nasty. So signs in the political world are becoming more and more intense. What about signs in nature, the natural signs Jesus mentions? He says there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. He gives us this list of three things to look for. Well, let's look and see what's been happening. There have always been famines and earthquakes, but what's happening now? Well, today, countless millions face food shortages in sub-Sahara Africa. You know, in one region alone, there are more than 28 million people. That's, that's about the population of California who don't have enough food. 
worldwide, a child dies of starvation every six seconds. Try to wrap your mind around that. That just blows my mind. Three million people in Somalia are dependent on food aid or they'll die. More than a billion people are without basic nutrition and 80% of children are born into families that cannot afford to feed them. Here's a, a, a world map that shows the amount of malnutrition in the world from the lack of access to food because of famine, poverty, politics, or war. And 805 million people don't have enough food to lead a healthy life. You know, Jesus says that we ought to be feeding people and helping people. That's one thing that we can do as Christians. These are just some of the famines that have happened over the last decade or two that you see. And, you know, in Sudan, 70,000 people killed in 1998, famine caused by war and drought. Uh, 1998 and 2000, major famine in Ethiopia. Maybe you remember the Ethiopia A concerts. And in 98 to 2004, the Second Congo War took the lives of 3.8 million people, mostly from starvation and disease. During that time, I was traveling around the world and traveling to Africa. And I didn't go to Congo because of the, the crisis there, but I met people from the Congo. And the stories they told were just awful. So famine is very real in this world right now, even though we sit here probably get enough food, but you go around the world, you saw that map, people are hungry, and it has taken place. And then you look at pestilence. Jesus talked about pestilence. Now, this one you just see happening. You see news articles on this all the time. You know, Streptococcus A was something that used to give us this, uh, a sore throat. Now it's flesh-eating bacteria. You know, it's eating disease. Spinal meningitis is making a comeback. You got black plague in, in rats on the West Coast, and they can just stay over there. The Ebola virus, you know, that, that's a nasty thing, isn't it? Made its way to the United States, what was it, last year? You know, that, that turns your heart into oatmeal mush. And you just start bleeding internally. And blood just starts oozing out of you everywhere. And, and, and it's going to kill you. TB, uh, uh, drug-resistant TB is making a comeback. You have SARS, West Nile virus, mad cow disease, Lyme's de disease. Do we know what Lyme's disease is here on the East Coast? Man, there's a lot of it around. A lot of it around. Often gets misdiagnosed. And then we got this new nasty thing, the Zika virus. You know, there's always something new coming along, something really nasty. And of course, you know, the, the devastating effects on the unborn child, a pregnant person, was just highlighted during the Olympics because you had some female athletes who just decided, and even males, that decided not to go to Brazil to because of the fear of this. But what we don't know is the long-term effects of Zika. And scientists are trying to figure that out. We know the short-term effects on the, on the newborn, but we don't know the long-term effects. But this is just as Jesus predicted, more and more pestilences. Now, I'm very thankful for what's happening in the area of research and the, the medicine that tries to defeat this stuff, and we need to pray and help fund that stuff as well. But really, friends, the only long-term solution is the return of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's the return of Jesus because, because these, these things morph and they get stronger and stronger. And now we've got this uh, antibiotic-resistant disease going on because we've overused antibiotics. And man, that's been a life-saving miracle drug, but it's, it's losing its potency and its power. So we see this happening, the pestilences. And then what about earthquakes? This is one of those contentious issues that people say, we've always had earthquakes, they're not increasing. Well, let's ask the experts on this. Uh, the United States Geological Survey says this, beginning in 2001, the average number of earthquakes occurring per year of magnitude three or greater increased significantly, culminating in a six-fold increase in 2011 over 20th century levels. You probably can't see this, but back in 1970s, 21 events per year. In the 1980s, 31 events per year. These are 3.0 and above earthquakes per year. And then in 2011, right there, 2010, 151 events per year. And it's not just because of better recording and tracking, because we've had the tracking. It's something more than that. They're just increasing. And then they're bigger as well. I mean, you've got the Asian tsunami in 2004, the earthquake that caused that tsunami, 9.3. It was the first earthquake to be felt by every device on Earth, 10 minutes long, longest recorded. It created a huge 800-mile gash in the seabed, and it killed all, more than 230,000 people. It's phenomenal. Just 230,000 people gone right there, wiped out. 
and there have been 1,906 tsunamis since 1900. But this 2004 tsunami caused more devastation than all the previous ones combined. Isn't that amazing? And then in 2011, we had the Tohoku tsunami, the one that hit Japan. 9.0 earthquake caused that, 50-foot waves. It destroyed the Fukushima nuclear plant, leaked radioactive material. They've tracked that radioactive material all the way down to Hawaii. We've got friends in Hawaii, and we visited them the last several summers. You go swimming, and then you glow in the night, dark at night because of the radioactive... Yeah, you got that. So 16,000 people died. We don't know the effects of all that radioactive material. In fact, there's a beach in California because it comes from Japan. The current goes down, dips around Hawaii, and then it goes up the West Coast. There's a beach in California. They've got shut down because of this. So as you look at this, you see, yes, earthquakes indeed are increasing. They're getting more intense, more devastating. And you have to ask yourself, then what time is it? You know, how big are the contractions? Jesus said these are the beginning of sorrows. The contractions will get more and more intense as we get near the end. But, you know, we kind of get immune to it after a while, don't we? You know, you, you, you get these mass shootings going on, and they happen so much now, it's just kind of like you expect one a month, right? You just expect that this stuff is going to happen, and we get desensitized to it. So what I want to do in closing here is I want to take you back to 9-11-2001. Okay? Take you back to when those planes flew into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. And I want to just kind of track what's happened since then. Because really, on that date, the world changed in a very significant way. It's never been the same. And when you look and you just kind of track what's been happening, you just see these contractions one after another since then. So we had 9-11. It changed the, the air industry. It changed flying. I've, I've I've flown million, a couple million miles, actually, in my life, and it changed flying. I don't even like flying anymore, so I don't fly hardly anymore because it's so crazy. But do you remember what happened right after, after that? I mean, just right on the tail of 9-11, we had the anthrax scare. You remember that? Somebody was sending anthrax. It was very deadly. I think they, they traced it back to Fort Detrick. It came from there. And somebody was sending this in the mail. A couple people died from that, in fact. And then you had the war in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. We went to find bin Laden. It cost us a billion dollars a month, but it cost us a lot of lives of our own flesh and blood died there. And then no sooner than that, we got major flooding in Europe. Countless people suddenly lose their homes. And while we're trying to absorb that news, Enron collapses. You probably never heard of it before. But since 2008, you know, Enron was the first big shakeup of the economy. And Time Magazine asked, how sticky will it get? And nobody had any idea how sticky it was going to get at that time. And then we had right on the heels of that, the nuclear threat in North Korea. That continues to this day. Do you remember the Beltway Sniper? Of course you do. That was September of, two, well, August, September of 2003. We were actually just moving here at that time. I moved here in September of 2003 from, from California, and we had the Beltway Snipers, the two guys going around killing people. And since then, that was just the beginning of these shoot crazy shootings. Since then, you know, you've got Newtown, you've got Aurora, the Washington Navy Yard, Virginia Tech, and it just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? And it seems like it never ends. We had the war in Iraq, billion dollars a week spent here, lots of lives lost there. We got Saddam Hussein, but then we created more mess. You know, and we've got other issues. Now we have ISIS. And then there was SARS that came right after that. This new epidemic, this strange new respiratory disease we didn't know anything about before. A heat wave hits Europe that's devastating, that takes life. Then you have the mad cow crisis and salmonella in produce, produce affecting the, the food chain. In fact, this was big in Europe. And the Europeans, all of a sudden, there was this big rush to vegetarianism. There was a lot of vegetarianism that happened. That no longer was vegetarianism was for the crazy hippies. It was like, I don't want mad cows because that's some bad stuff. You know, it takes over your brain. You start stumbling around and you die a horrible death. And then there was Hurricane Isabel. Do you remember that one? We got that one right here. In fact, that was the week we moved here. Uh, it knocked out electricity for a week, and it was like, welcome to Maryland. My wife and I and our two little kids at the time 
Hurricane Isabel. But that was just the beginning of four big hurricanes in 2004. We had the Southeast Asian tsunami that killed more than a quarter million people that we already mentioned. The London bombings in the, in the subway, terrorist bombs. 2005, 27 named hurricanes. They ran out of names because they ran through the whole alphabet. 26 letters. They had to circulate back through on the 27th. First time it happened. How about Hurricane Katrina? I grew up just an hour out of New Orleans in a little town called Baton Rouge that just got devastated by floods. And here you had Hurricane Katrina, one of the worst disasters to hit, natural disasters to hit America. People were looting and killing each other. They were left high and stranded there in the Superdomes. It was just amazing. And then we have the new nuclear threats coming out of Iran. They want to wipe the country of Israel off the map. We had to slide into ruin with the, with the huge financial collapse. People lost their houses and, and we're still trying to clean up that mess. The earthquake in Haiti in 2010, 150,000 people killed by that earthquake. Then we had the deep water horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, from April to September, 5 million barrels of oil dumped into the Gulf of Mexico, ruining the environment. America's credit was downgraded from a triple A to a double A. Fortunately, we've recovered some of that but I think that's the beginning of a wobbly economy. We had the Arab Spring. I was traveling to the Middle East at that time, and my Middle Eastern friends, I remember this one Egyptian guy said, oh, this is good news for the Middle East. It's been nothing but a disaster. Out of that, we see ISIS has come up, and it's been a real disaster. We have the Japanese tsunami we talked about in Fukushima. You know, it's the fifth most powerful earthquake in history, the most powerful in Japanese history, uh, 25 million tons of debris, $122 billion in damage. Just an am amazing thing. We had the tornado in Joplin, 2011. $2.8 billion of damage in, in that tornado. And then the Syrian civil war that we've talked about. 400,000 people killed since the civil war started in 2011. And the refugee crisis. What about Hurricane Sandy? It seems like the East Coast keeps coming up. And here's Hurricane Sandy. You know, there are parts of New York City that still have not been rebuilt in spite of all the money sent there. Parts of New York City still not rebuilt. 2013, the Boston Marathon bombing by the Sarnev brothers started making us feel more and more vulnerable. Drug-resistant TB. Bees are dying. It's going to affect the pollination and agriculture. The Philippines typhoon, 2013. And I could go on and on, but I'm already depressed. How about you? <laughs> that's depressing and the name of this thing is called revelation of depression no it's revelation of hope right it's revelation of peace that's right thank you revelation of peace revelation of peace but look how depressing this is but this is where jesus makes a difference because as we look at these things through the lens of the scripture we ask what time is it how big are the contractions? How close are we to the actual delivery? And it's in that context that there's one more prophecy there in Matthew 24. Jesus says, and this gospel, the kingdom, will be preached in all the world. You want to read it with me? As a witness to all the nations, and then what? Then the end will come. You see, this prophecy is being fulfilled as well, and this is where you get into good news. In 1800, the Bible was in less than 70 languages today, 100 million copies 2200 languages christianity is growing around the world in africa it's growing 65 percent faster than the population in south america four times faster than the population in china there are 100 million christians in communist china where you can't even have a private church it's all state-run churches the church is growing like crazy so this prophecy is being fulfilled and why is the gospel going to all the world because god loves you god loves the world and he sees it falling apart, and the reason it's falling apart is because of sin. You know, some people ask, why? Why all the devastation? Why does God allow it? Why does he let this planet just disintegrate? You know, it's really not a fair question because it's us who's caused all the problems because we disconnect it from God. God created a perfect earth. We said we can do it better without you, and we're the ones that's messed it all up. But God doesn't hold that against us. God lets the consequences work their way out. But meanwhile, he says, listen, I've got a better world for you. If you want to sign up for that one, here's the place to sign up right here. Just confess me as your Savior. 
and then you can have this better world. You can have the new world that is soon coming. See, see, I think God wants us to stop putting our hope in this place and put our hope in the future place. You know, life is painful, isn't it? Life is difficult. You look at the things that have happened tonight that we've talked about tonight in the world, the signs in the political, the religious world, and the natural world, and those represent the destruction of life, people's finances, loss of loved ones, job problems, relationship issues affect us. But here's what the Bible says. I want to leave you with this positive note. There in John 16, Jesus says this about these contractions. A woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being is born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. You see, right now we may have sorrow, but Jesus says, I'm going to come again, and your heart will rejoice, and you'll have eternal joy that nobody can take from you. Isn't that great news? So, yes, we live in a land that is in upheaval. We live in a world that is falling apart. But Jesus says, when you see these things begin to happen, lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. Somebody last night said, I want to know about the signs of the times. And listen, when you study this, you see that the signs of the times say clearly, we are in the last days. Things are breaking loose. We are setting up for the stuff you read in Revelation. The mark of the beast, the financial control, that's all coming, my friends. And there's nothing that any of us can do to stop it. But we can be ready for it by investing time in understanding revelation and investing time in getting that relationship with God. How many of you want to invest that time? Let me see your hands. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, indeed, we do thank you that you love us, that you tell us beforehand what's going to happen so that we can be ready for it, so that we can spend that time building the relationship that will last throughout eternity with you. So, Lord, we're investing that time. We're here. We're here even on a, a night of nasty weather because this is top priority to us. Continue to teach us and lead us and help us to understand you better and love you more. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.